All across Missouri, our new car and truck dealers are building strong local economies. When you buy a car or truck in Missouri, you're helping to support over 20,000 Missouri families who rely on the auto industry for good-paying local jobs. You're also helping fund our communities, schools, first responders, and our roads because dealers generate millions of dollars in tax revenue. Missouri's automobile dealers have been the foundation of our communities for generations and for generations to come. The Missouri Automobile Dealers Association, the heart of Missouri. This week in Missouri politics, we want to get started right away today with our very special guest, Senator Jamila Nasheed from uh, representing St. Louis City, correct? Absolutely. Thanks Senator, for having me on, Scott. Welcome. I'm so glad you're here. I want to get started this week from your work in the Senate. This week, the education bill began debate in the Senate. The, the floor leader said you would finish next week. What happened? Well, it's going to take some time. I don't think we should push through a bill of that magnitude. I mean, we're talking about change in education from how it used to be. I mean, we haven't changed education in over a decade. So we're dealing with a very, very serious piece of legislation, probably one of the most significant piece of legislation this year and for years to come. So we're taking our time. We have some great provisions inside. One provision is social promotions. We will no longer allow for children to be passed on from one grade to the next knowing that they cannot read and write. And that's what's happening throughout the public school system right now today. So this debate really got into gear when a couple school districts were unaccredited. Yeah. The, from what I've always heard education policymakers discuss is those, those school districts are problems. The major problem would be St. Louis City going unaccredited. Where's the status of St. Louis City schools? Right now, we're provisionally accredited. I don't think that we're going to be unaccredited. I think that Dr. Adams is doing a great job uh, trying to get us to the next level. However, we do have so many children that are below proficiency in the areas of math and science and uh, literature. So we have a long way to go, and I think we're going to get there with Dr. Adams. It seemed like the governor vetoed the bill last year, and part of his reasoning was charter schools and kind of go into some private options. Where are you on that issue? Well, right now, I, I truly believe with the way that the educational system is structured right now, again, where children are being passed on from one grade level to the next, not knowing how to read and write, we have to bring forth options. So if the bill contains that, you'll support it again? Absolutely. Have you had a conversation with Governor Nixon about this bill? No. He said he was going to be on the third floor more. He said he was going to engage. Has, do you, have other senators talked to him? Has he engaged? I'm sure uh, the uh, handler of the bill, uh, the sponsor of the bill, uh, I'm sure he's talking to the governor's office, Senator Nadal. She's uh, probably at the table as well. So they're having conversations with the governor's office. I'm just not a part of the conversation, in which I don't have to be. Do I you, just want the bill to pass. Will the bill come up for a vote next week? Again, we don't want to rush this thing through. We want to make sure that uh, we're dealing with all of the kinks now so that when we get over to the House, we don't have any problems and we can get it to the governor's desk and, it can, and he can sign but it. But isn't it important to pass it earlier this year so that during the legislative session, the governor will have to veto it or sign it and you can work on an override, you can work on a new bill? I mean, you're obviously doing this much earlier than last year. Is that strategic? Very strategic. I think that what we're doing right now uh, is extremely strategic, and that's getting it out uh, in the forefront before any other legislation. Um, we're going to get it done. I think we're going to get it done. People are very optimistic about it. You have individuals working on both sides of the aisle. I mean, that's unheard of. Sure. <laughs> and, so, and so when you have a piece of legislation where you have Republicans as well as Democrats collectively working together, you know we have something good. Speaking of another issue that was bipartisan, there were some hearings last week. Senator Schaefer's committee brought in some of the firefighters that were, that were helping work in Ferguson during, the, during some of the rioting. They were said they were left unprotected by the National Guard. You followed the debate. What is your take? You know, that, that was really appalling, you know, to hear those individuals 
and, to t and for them to talk about how sad they were to have to leave people behind and burn in buildings was appalling to me. I mean, how can you put for a state of emergency and allow for approximately 20, bu 20, to 20 buildings to burn? Sure, but the firefighters' so, take was they were getting shot at. Oh, absolutely, and, and they had all the right to, you know, uh, get out of harm's way. And I think that the National Guard should have been there protecting them every step of the way. And unfortunately, they, they were not there. David Lee with the Associated Press wrote a very in-depth article about some of the government documents available to track the timeline of Governor Nixon's actions. Will, will there be more hearings on this issue and will you be involved in those? Oh, I'm, I'm on the committee, so most definitely I will be involved. And we're gonna, you know, we're gonna bring some things to light. Again, how do we uh, allow for buildings to burn down under a state of emergency. Who calls for the National Guards to back away from Ferguson in terms of the ground zero? I mean, everything else was being protected. Ground zero is where they should have been because that's where, where it all started. You were extremely active with the protesters during last fall and, and, in the, and earlier in the summer. Do you feel like there's some responsibility on your part and those that were very active in protesting to make sure that the firefighters, you have their back. I mean, they were, they were just there for, to serve the public that night and put out fires. Do you feel like you have a little added responsibility to be sure that you hold the state, the state accountable to keeping them safe? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, those young men and women, they go out and they protect lives. And we have to be able, ready, and willing to protect their interests as well. I mean, they, they put their lives on the line each and every day from the police, law enforcement, from police officers to firefighters. So we have to back them up. Well, let's go to a topic that um, is much less serious in reality, but to some of your constituents might even be on the same level. The NFL in St. Louis. The Rams have said they're leaving. Most insiders say, well, okay, the Rams are probably leaving. But there's other teams. The Jaguars have been mentioned. The new stadium might be for them. I thought it was interesting. The design looked a little bit uh, in keeping with the Jaguars' colors. Will there be NFL football in St. Louis? I truly believe so. Uh, right now, I think that um, it's, it's a gamble. You know, uh, individuals playing their bets right now. However, uh, we're talking approximately a billion dollars. It, it would take a billion dollars, approximately, to, to build a new stadium. And we're still, what, we're still paying, what, 20 four million a year on the dome right now since 1995. This is your district though, right? And this, this is, is development, this is, my this district. is jobs. It's jobs. I think that the, uh, the unions, uh, they're gonna be excited and elated that we have a new development coming forward. But I think it needs to go to the vote of the people. I think the people should decide this. I don't think that we should start spending taxpayers' dollars uh, without the people uh, input. When that goes to the vote of the people, will you be supporting it? Oh, absolutely. It is an interesting thing. It's not just, it's that part of the riverfront. It's not the best place to be right now. It would be a beautiful new downtown stadium. The unions came forward yesterday. What was your response when the unions came forward and said, we'll work overtime, we'll work nights, 24 hour schedules, and we'll do it for free, no extra money? That's a good thing. You know, the unions are doing all they need to do in order to uh, make this deal a deal, yep. other than a deal breaker. H however, we need to make sure that we have inclusion. I think that with what's going on in the city of St. Louis and the unrest in Ferguson, we have to begin to look and think outside of the box. Minorities need to be a, a part of it. Are you this could be a project that could bring some people together oh, and start absolutely. starting some of that? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Let me get your quick takes on a few issues. Okay. Uh, first of all, the ethics bill that was passed a couple weeks ago didn't necessarily change a lot. Um, the House has a little bit stronger bill. What is your quick take on that? Well, people are looking for transparency and they want to have uh, confidence in the political process. That's what democracy is really all about. Yeah, people believe in... If you pass an ethics bill every week till the end of session, do you think the public will not think politicians are crooked? I think uh, we have less of the, those individuals thinking that. You'll have less. That's Absolutely. interesting. Uh, you have some new, uh, new blood here in the region. <laughs> the new county executive took over January 1st. Hits sure. the ground running. What's your take on his first few weeks? I think he's doing well. Uh, he's reaching out uh, to uh, those individuals that wasn't with him, and that, that's always a good thing. You know, I think that when you have opposition and when you become a winner, then you reach out to those individuals that was once in opposition uh, uh, against you, and you bring them into the camp. 
And that's what I think that's what he's doing best. The mayor of St. Louis, a friend of yours, has a new chief of staff, Mary Ellen Ponder. Yes. What's your take on that situation? I love it. Mary Ellen, she's going to do a great job. She was taught by the best. And uh, it's going to continue. Uh, you're going to continue to see nice things happening in the St. Louis area, from economic development to minority inclusion uh, and so forth. Last question. What is one issue that's not being debated in Jeff City right now that should be? Low-income housing development. I think we need more of that. So, uh, economic development, job know. creation. Yeah. Interesting. Well, Senator, thank you so much for Thanks being here. Thanks for on. having me. And we'll be right back with our This Week Opinion Maker panel. All across Missouri, our new car and truck dealers are building strong local economies. When you buy a car or truck in Missouri, you're helping to support over 20,000 Missouri families who rely on the auto industry for good paying local jobs. You're also helping fund our communities, schools, first responders, and our roads because dealers generate millions of dollars in tax revenue. Missouri's automobile dealers have been the foundation of our communities for generations and for generations to come. The Missouri Automobile Dealers Association, the heart of Missouri. And welcome back to This Week in Missouri Politics. We are thrilled to be here with one of the most topical opinion maker panels we've ever had, starting with Representative Jeremy LaFavre of Kansas City, Representative Ron Hicks of St. Charles County, Ann Schweitzer of Public Eye here in St. Louis, and Katie Casas, a governmental consultant with the Gateway Group. And Katie, it is, um, you are the best person to be here because we're going to talk education. You heard the Senator's comments from the interview earlier. Okay. What is in this bill and will it pass? Um, well, the House and Senate versions look uh, awfully similar. Um, I think it will pass. I think there will be a few things to work out in conference. I think we'll see the Senate take a vote this week. Um, I would also expect that we'll see the House take a vote this week. and, and we'll Give me the cliff notes on what's in it, though. Um, both bills have um, an expansion of charter schools for kids who live in, in failed school districts. Both bills have virtual schools for kids who live in failed districts. Um, as the senator said, the Senate version has some, um, some items that would restrict districts' abilities to promote students um, if they're not on grade level. Uh, both bills allow school districts that are near unaccredited districts to offer, put some restrictions in on who, who can transfer and, and how that process works. Seems um, like that passes. Does the governor sign it? Um, I think he will. I think um, that there, he has, this year, he's spent some time, at least in the Senate, he, he and his staff has, have spent some time with the um, at least Republican leadership on, on this bill. Um, I think they remain in, in pretty consistent communication and um, negotiations. And so I think all signs right now are pointing to, yeah, he will. Representative Favor, is there, does this pass with a veto-proof majority? I, you know, based on last year's vote, I think that... The, that may be an uphill climb. I think that taking the uh, the provisions in there uh, for public money to go to private schools, I think that's going to help uh, move move us towards that direction. I think there's a lot of good things in the bill. Kate talked about the virtual schools piece. I've been supportive of that for a very long time. Sure. I think accrediting uh, school buildings instead of the district as a whole is something that folks from Kansas City certainly can get on board. So um, depending on how things flesh out, like Kate said, you know, we've got to see how the compromises happen between the House and the Senate, but I'm optimistic that we can get a, a signature this year. I know this is an area of expertise for you. Has private money or has public money went into private schools previously? And under this bill, will that happen? Um, I don't know if, if public money has gone directly into a private school. I think there's arguments that can be made that somehow it does trickle in there. Mm -hmm. um, I think there's arguments that can be made that that is in here, but it's not a direct payment, which I think was what some of the, the heartburn was last year. And so I think Are you we, voting for this bill? Well, I've got to see uh, what's going to come across the desk. Uh, I don't sit on the education committee, so I've spent most of my time working on the budget the last couple of weeks. But uh, I'll listen to the debate and, and see what comes across the desk, and we'll make a decision then. Representative Hicks, does 109 of your 117 vote for this? I think we will. I actually think we have it this time. And the reason for it is, is we need to pass something. 
and I think we've known that for three years now in the House. And I, I'm no longer on the Education Committee, but I have been in the past two years. And it's hard to get something passed out of there. And this time, with the more members we have and the, the closer look that we're taking into this, the bill is w written very well. I prefer the Senate bill side myself, but I, I, I think we could have a veto majority on this one. And tell us the other side of this. I'm just happy that something so important to Missouri is being taken up by both by both parties. It's a huge thing for our society. We can all agree that education is the backbone and it's being treated like it's the backbone and I think that's the most important thing about it. So I'm happy to see the, the compromises that are being made. I like the 1% for virtual schools. I think that's fair and safe to see how that works, what happens, if that makes a difference. Um, I love charter schools. I think Kate probably agrees with me on that. So, And I think it's important that we treat charter schools as public schools. So as long as people can start looking at charter schools that way and we can keep moving forward on it, I think it's a good thing. So tell me the part of this that moves a little bit closer to funding those charter schools with public money. Tell us where the brushback is on that. Well, I think the brushback is the perception. And that's as long as that perception is that charter schools are not public schools, then that's going to keep happening. Is there, is there a um, issue, though, with, with not trying to experiment with things? I mean, nothing's going to get better if you don't do this. Is that, is that right? I, I agree wholeheartedly and, and just to go back to the charter schools, um, they are public schools. I mean they don't, you would be, um, if you think that there are more private donations going to charter schools than there are to public schools, you would be wrong. Um, <laughs> so so they, they are, there's no question that they are public schools. People who think that they aren't are just ill-informed, um, but, but to the experimenting um, the, the experimenting thing. I think um, experimenting is probably not the right word. I, you know, most of the things that we have offered, that have been offered even in the bill that was vetoed last year, they're not really experiments. They've worked elsewhere. Um, and so, but getting them, you know, a Missouri solution for Missouri kids has, has been, has been a problem. But I, I, you know, one thing I disagree with Ann on is the 1% on virtual schools. I, I think that that's, that that's an arbitrary number. I think we should let parents make that decision and kids make that decision. And it's, it's not an experiment. There are lots of states that have these virtual options. And um, I wish we weren't, we weren't capping the number of kids. You who fought could do this that. fight when no one thought you could. You were the lone voice, and now you're on the cusp of passing a bill, actually. Um, are you, if, if you would have had this deal four years ago, three years ago when you worked on this, how happy would you have been? And are you pleased with, with what's happening? Uh, we would have absolutely been happy with this deal four years ago, but four years ago, um, you know, we, we are the show me state, and so even though four years ago we were saying this will happen, there will be a time when a district becomes unaccredited and the courts say they have this right to transfer, and at that time nobody believed us. Um, we could have had this same deal four years ago and prevented the headache of the last 18 months, but we require um, here in Missouri for, for uh, there to be evidence. So. Here we are. Speaking of evidence, I think there, and there was a lot of folks that thought Jason Kander was just taking a vanity run, right? He was, he was going to do the stories where, oh, Jason Kander should run, and then he would run for re-election. He didn't come out with an outstanding video. You had to be excited. I, I am excited. Um, I actually was more excited when I read the uh, Missouri House, the Missouri Republican press release about Kander, saying that he was for Obamacare and it, you know, <laughs> all about amnesty. And then I read his things and watch his stuff, and I'm just a little bit the liberal part of me. Is you a had to bit be impressed excited. by the video, though. I was impressed Very by impressed the video. video. Great message got out. I think um, I was more impressed by his list of supporters in his press release when he talked about he has. Um, all statewide Democrats. I think it's interesting who didn't support him in that press release to look at that. Who um, didn't support him? Well, there's just a few different um, county, city officials that didn't support him. That, Understand. So um, what's interesting, I think, also is we were talking about a little behind the scenes, but what this means for McCaskill in the future. If Kander wins, does McCaskill do people start saying, well, we can't have two Democrats as senators, and then I'm worried about McCaskill because I'm definitely a bigger fan of McCaskill. Very interesting. Uh, Representative Flavor, you know this man very well. I do. Tell us about his rollout. I, it was one of the most impressive rollouts I've ever seen. The I'm not just saying that. The video was oh. absolutely incredible. Jason Kander has got the most dynamic, most impressive team in state politics, and I believe that not just because he's a friend, but, but because it's true. Um, the way they rolled that message out with uh, Jason and the discipline with his wife Diana and his chief of staff, Abe Rakov, I think that is a team that is going to uh, produce the next United States Senator without a doubt. He is a very impressive chief of staff. I think most people in state politics know him and know him well now. 
How do you separate from Barack Obama? An 08, Bush was not on the ballot, but he was still very much hanging over that election. Some Republicans lost. How does he go to Greene County, St. Charles County, Clay County, and separate himself from some of the negatives of Barack Obama? I, I don't think it's so important that, the, that Jason Kander separate himself from our president. I think the most important thing for Jason Kander to do is define himself as who he is. And if you take that four-minute video and stretch that out into a two-year campaign, message discipline, I served my country when, when I was called. This generation's biggest issue was 9-11, and I came to my country's rescue and served overseas and came here and fought uh, corruption. You contrast that with a career politician and somebody who's been in Washington, D.C. for 20 years, you're looking at a, a United States Senator in Jason Kander. Representative Hicks, um, is this a citizen soldier wanting to serve his country in the United States Senate, or is this a Barack Obama clone? No, this, I don't believe him to be a Barack Obama clone at all. I really don't. And that's being straight honest. Now, sure. everyone keeps talking about this video. I mean, I personally have not seen the video, but I do know of his military background. Let me just tell you, Ron, the video is good. I, I'm going I'm to watch it. As soon as we leave here, you can count on me finding it and watching it. You can count on it. But I think he will run on himself, and that's what he's going to need to do. He's very powerful, and he is running against one of the most powerful senators that I think Missouri has here. That's a man that went to Washington, did not separate himself from Missouri, comes back, speaks to the people here, travels the state when he is here. Spoke to your caucus this week, correct? Sp exactly. Spoke to our caucus this week, talked about how unity, uniting, staying together as a team, individuality isn't going to work. We need to pull together, come together, pick issues that are not going to divide our caucus, stay on track, stay together as a team. That's how we win. That's how we stay together. And I think that's what his campaign is going to do as well. Ron Hicks, let me get your take on something. Uh, Ann mentioned Claire McCaskill and how this affects her. How does this affect the rest of the Democratic ticket? The one thing about Roy Blunt, he has an outstanding machine himself. They execute, they turn out votes. Uh, one statewide Republican candidate told me that Roy's being, Roy having a contested race might be worth three points to him. How do you see that affecting the statewide races? I think it can f affect McCaskill seriously. Um, well, for one, we got to look at the, de the Democrats, okay? There's been kind of a good balance, except for in the statewide races here, and I think those are the seats we're actually pushing for right now. So it's going to take a little bit, it's going to put a little bit of pressure on her, and it may take away a few things from her, I think, in the same time. Ms. Cousins, do you see this affecting Chris Kosterin before he might be able to separate himself, be the all prosecutor, no politics? Now he has 501c3s coming in here, probably predominantly to maybe not compliment the Democratic Party. How do you see this affecting other people on the ballot? Well, I mean, I got to say, first, I'm excited as somebody that likes to watch watch Absolutely. the politics play out. I mean, I enjoyed watching watching Jason run when he ran for Secretary of State the first time, and that Shane Scholler candor race was an exciting one. I expect more this time. Um, you know, I'm not sure. I think Chris Coster has proved himself to be a, a great campaigner. I'm sure his team is, is busy figuring out just that. What do they have to do to shift gears, if anything? Um, I think there might be a chance that a Kander Coster um, on the ticket at the same time helps the Democrats. But like you said, I mean, I think, I think uh, Roy having a, um, a race also could help the Republicans. I mean, I think we're probably in for a, a, a real race here up and down the ticket. Um, as we as we watch our, our both sides of the statewide races fill out. Speaking of big competitive contest, um, the big issue in many parts of the state is the Rams coming or going. Uh, we're very glad to have Representative Favor on from Kansas City. There was an editorial in the Kansas City Star this week that said, "Don't give St. Louis something without giving Kansas City something." What is the take in the legislature, and where do you? We heard the senator discuss that she thinks that in her district is where the stadium would be should be built. What is the mood in the legislature, and what's the mood in Kansas City about building a stadium in St. Louis? I think the biggest news piece that came out about all of this is the vast majority of the state found out that there was a football team in St. Louis. <laughs> um, aside from, from jokes, I think that you're going to have a hard time uh, getting folks on my side of the state, and just generally, to, to put up tens or hundreds of millions of dollars for a new stadium um, from taxpayer dollars. I think that's just going to be a real, real tough lift. Um, I'm not certain that I'm willing to support it yet. Um, i got to take a look at it. I'm probably leaning towards no, and I think that's probably where the vast majority of the legislature is sitting, too. Is this a regional thing, though? I mean, the budget currently funds part of the Kansas City sports complexes, right? Um, there's some of those state money that goes to the Dome. It's not the first time public money's went into stadiums in Missouri. Do you think that it's just the time where that begins to end? Or is it more of a regional thing? I think it's a matter of cost benefit. I think the stadiums in Kansas City and what, what is invested there is around $5 million to state taxpayer dollars. Um, and that's been in law for the last 25 years. We'll have another five. What they're asking for in St. Louis is a heck of a lot more for almost a similar return. So if we're 
going to invest 10, 15, 20 times as much, shouldn't we be expecting as much of an increase in a return? And I don't think the Rams produce that. Well, one member of the media has advocated you should just to make up for 1985, but uh, Representative Hicks, <laughs> Representative Hicks, what do you think? Moving will well, there be football in St. Louis and will public money go into it? I don't want public money to go into it. I will vote against that 100% and I'll give my take on it. One of the reasons why is sitting in the legislature, we hear we need money for education, we need money for Medicaid, <laughs> things like that, and we don't have it, but all of a sudden we have money for a football stadium. How's that happen? How's that work? I want to get to the bottom of that one right there. I just heard this morning on the, on, uh, the radio about um, the San Diego Chargers and the Los Angeles Rams coming together to build a football stadium. And in the same note, they also said that's going to hurt the Rams' chances of moving to California. I want to know why. I want to get deal. to that as well. Katie, can, is St. Louis an NFL city without some public investment? Uh, I think it's tough. I think it's tough to keep a team without, without, some, without some public investment. I mean, it, um, whether or not that should happen, I think I'm, I'm going to leave to those elected to, to have to make those decisions. <laughs> um, but I, I, think it's, I think it's tough to figure out how it happens without, without some public investment. Yeah. Well, Ann, let's, let's give the elected officials some guidance here. How do you keep the NFL football in St. Louis? And is it worth it? Well... I don't know if it's worth it. I think the, the main thing that most St. Louisans are going to care about is we want to have three professional sports teams that we can get behind and care about because we think that we're that big of a city and we need three. And I think that's fair. But I'm, I'm a Cardinals Blues girl, so NFL is not necessarily my thing. <laughs> uh, Jeremy, if the Chiefs were leaving, there would be huge protests and the city would come apart, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Might not be that in St. Louis. No. Mm -hmm. Uh, quick take, uh, there was one issue that we wanted to cover really quickly, and that is the, the hearing center Schaefer had, where he brought in the firefighters that put out some of the stuff in Ferguson. Ryan, I know you're very tied into the law enforcement community, the emergency services community. What was your take on those hearings? It was, it, the, hear, the hearings themselves go very well, I think, especially when you have our first responders coming in and speaking of their dangers and what they had to do and explaining to the public why they had to, some, some of the public was still under, the, why'd they run? Why'd they leave? Why are they not putting out these fires? We fell really short when we did not have the National Guard protecting our first responders and firefighters. That is where we failed. They so easily could have surrounded the firefighters like they were surrounding buildings back in Clayton and places like that where they didn't even need to be. They needed to be in the hot spot, just like in a war zone. You have to go to the hot spot. They could have protected our firefighters, and our firefighters would not have had to drop their hoses and run. That would be like a police officer walking into a firefight and going, whoa, and when I mean a firefight, I'm talking a gun battle, and dropping their guns and running. We just don't need to see that happen. Katie, have we heard the last of this? Absolutely not. No, um, no I think it's pretty And what, what, what is there possibly that could be explained why they weren't protected? I think it's pretty obvious when when all of um, when the National Guard was coming, people said they're not going to be in Ferguson because we don't want them to be to look like they're attacking protesters. And so that was said up front: we're not going to have them in Ferguson. We're going to have them other places. And we're going to have police officers in Ferguson. That was that was said clearly at the beginning. So it's I see that it's a problem, and I think we can all see that now. But it was said at the beginning that's what was going to happen. Representative Favor, we haven't heard the last of this, have we? Uh, I don't think we have, but I honestly think that um, th there's more politics than real actual substantive policy at play here. Interesting. Thank you all very much for joining us, and thank you for joining us, and we will see you next week here on This Week in Missouri Politics. Mm -hmm.